Hi everyone, welcome to Fusion EP Talks. While yeah, uh, we are going to to start the the talk, uh, we will present today to Alessandro Tassone. Uh, he is a, a doctor. Uh, he is already going to explain us uh, more about the magnetohydrodynamic modeling for liquid metal systems and components. He come from the from the department of uh, astro astronautical electrical and energy engineering at Sapienza University of Rome, Italy, and he will tell something about the liquid metals and why are the promising fluids for application in breathing blankets in in plasma phasing components and and how they they work and and what is about his research. I, I give the floor to, to Alessandro to, to start the talk. Okay, thank you, Jose, very much. So as uh, Jose kindly introduced me, I am a postdoc researcher at Sapienza University of Rome, and today we are going to talk about MHD modeling for liquid metal system components. Before we start, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Fusion AP for inviting me and for, let's say, giving me the opportunity to share uh, my talk about this topic. So since you're attending uh, a talk on Fusion AP, I trust that you know very well what a fusion reactor uh, is about. So I'm not going to bore you with details about why we want to smash hydrogen atoms together to produce energy. What is important to remember though, is that the most important, the most convenient uh, reaction uh, really to use uh, for that purpose is the deuterium tritium reaction. Uh, unfortunately, uh, tritium uh, is a uh, rather scarce uh, in nature. So it's a, it's a bit uh, difficult to use as a fuel. Uh, the most, uh, this is one of the most important uh, um, technical challenge in the realization of fusion energy. And a way to solve this issue is to surround the vacuum chamber where the reaction is happening with a so-called breeding blanket. This is a component that uh, essentially uses a neutron capture reaction to produce tritium by bombarding lithium with the very uh, fusion neutrals that are produced by the, uh, the, um, the reaction itself in the vacuum chamber. Uh, there are several uh, uh, concepts of breathing blanket that are studied nowadays in Europe and in the world, but one of the most popular way uh, to uh, have the lithium inside the breathing blanket is in a, a neotactic alloy with lead, a so-called uh, uh, lead lithium uh, liquid metal. Now, um, this is uh, interesting because a liquid metal is characterized by high electrical conductivity. And uh, as you are aware, of course, in order to confine the plasma uh, where the reaction is happening, we need very strong magnetic field. Uh, this uh, uh, gives rise to a lot of funny phenomena inside our, uh, our component, essentially because the velocity field of our electrically conductive fluid and the confinement magnetic field tend to interact with each other. Uh, here, there is a basic example to make you understand why these phenomena are important for the design of this component. Let's consider, for example, a square channel, which is representative of the elementary geometrical uh, uh, configuration that we are in a blanket. So in hydrodynamic condition, what would we expect if the flow is laminar is that the velocity profile is as this parabolic shape. Now, if we apply a magnetic field, uh, what will happen essentially is that we induce current inside the liquid metal. These currents uh, as well will interact with the magnetic field, uh, creating the Lorentz forces that will, in general, do a lot of stuff, but mostly opposing fluid motion and modifying the velocity profile in a much different shape than the one that we are used uh, in our aerodynamic uh, condition. The um, amount of deviation between uh, um, the MHD and the ordinary aerodynamic condition of, if you want, the high intensity of the MHD effect is characterized by this dimensionless group, the Arkman number, that you can see is basically proportional to the intensity of the applied magnetic field. In a fusion reactor, this number, which is values uh, close to 10 to the power of four. So this is the basic phenomena, but this is not the end of the story because uh, Contrary wise of what happens in regular uh, fluid dynamics, uh, what is also important is also the kind of wall that we are using to confine our fluid. For example, here is, is a snapshot of two different velocity profiles 
that you could observe using electrically insulated walls, so a wall that is made of glass or plexiglass, and all electrically conducting walls like one made of steel. So you can see there is quite a difference in the velocity profile. And in the other case, for example, we observe the generation of high velocity jets. This difference in the behavior of the fluid depending on the electrical conductivity of the wall is characterized by this other dimensionless parameter, the wall conductance ratio. And of course, in a fusion reactor, we will, be, we will deal mostly with electrically conducting walls, so we can expect this parameter to have this order of magnitude. Another important consequence uh, due to the uh, onset of these Lorentz forces inside the fluid is that in general, the magnetic field tends to suppress uh, velocity oscillation. Uh, what this means, uh, in fact, you can see in this picture, here we have the vortex shedding behind a square cylinder. And you can see that we have essentially three-dimensional instability that are breaking apart the vortex sheet, uh, giving rise to turbulence. If I apply a magnetic field to this obstacle, what happens is that the magnetic field suppress instabilities and basically makes the flow much more steady. This uh, uh, phenomenon is essentially uh, um, is pushing the critical Reynolds number for the transition between laminar and turbulent regime. And in a fusion reactor, though, we can expect the flow to be mostly laminar, even if not strictly always laminar. What are the consequences of these uh, phenomena for the engineering of breathing blank? Well, one of the most important phenomena is the increase of pressure loss. Here you can see a diagram that is showing you the dimensionless pressure coefficient, essentially a measure of how much is our pressure loss. Uh, that is scaled with the magnetic field intensity through the Hartmann number. So, of course, as you would expect in hydrodynamic condition, the pressure coefficient is not uh, uh, dependent on Hartmann. But you can see when we apply a magnetic field, this pressure coefficient grow very fast with the intensity of the magnetic field. And essentially what we are going to expect is that the pressure loss in a fission reactor is going to be between four and six order of magnitudes uh, larger than the pressure loss that the fluid will experience in other dynamic conditions. This, of course, has a huge consequence for the design of the reactor and thus flow velocity is usually minimized in order to reduce the amount of pressure loss that we have to deal with. Another consequence of what the phenomena that I just described, the reversion of flow regime toward laminarization is important for heat and mass transport. Here, for example, there is a, a simple way to understand that here, this is a natural convection case. So we have a cubic cavity and we have a, a differentially uh, heated walls, a hot one and a cold one. So what we expect is that the fluid is going to uh, be set in motion by the difference in density between the um, close to the hot and the cold wall. When we apply a magnetic field, essentially what we observe is a, a suppression of this movement and thus a, a strong dampening of the Nusselt number effectively of the heat transfer. This is, a, this is a, what it means. It means essentially that we can expect heat transfer coefficient to be much smaller in a many aerodynamic condition compared with what we would expect with ordinary hydrodynamic condition. For this reason, several blanket concepts uses a secondary non-conductive coolant in order to remove the volumetric heating from neutron bombardment and the heat loads on the first wall. So what I wanted to, okay, this is a just, uh, let's say, a brief overview of the main phenomena, but what you, is important to remember, what I want to stress is that when we are applying a magnetic field to an electrically conducting fluid, essentially your, your complete flow features are going to change. And this is an effect of any parameters that is important for the engineering of the component. For this reason, we need the MHD analysis in order to properly design the breathing blanket. How do we deal with this problem? Uh, essentially, what you can use are the three techniques that you should be familiar with. Uh, because essentially, any engineering problem is solved either through experiments, through analytical or theoretical study, or numerical study. From the title of this talk, you should know that my research, uh, you should, uh, you know, let's say, assume already that most of my research uh, is dealing with uh, numerical study. But I wanted to mention some peculiarities of uh, this class of flows that make uh, uh, even more attractive, let's say, numerical 
uh, the numerical approach. So regarding experimental study, of course, those are uh, uh, the very basis of any scientific advancement. But in order to characterize MHT flows, you have essentially to deal with a liquid metal. Uh, dealing with a liquid metal in experimental context is very difficult, uh, mostly because uh, liquid metal can be corrosive, think of lead, toxic, think of mercury, and can be uh, outright explosive, uh, especially if you use uh, uh, alloys like sodium potassium or liquid uh, lithium. So it's very difficult in general to perform experiments using uh, uh, liquid metal. Um, but it's even more difficult and expensive when you have to consider that, for example, to employ lead lithium, you need them to keep those fluids at temperature that are close to 300, 400 Celsius degree. And beside that, you also have to include a very expensive magnet system. So this, uh, um, this makes it very challenging to study this kind of problem. So, uh, uh, with experiments uh, and one of the uh, critical difficulties is that right now it's very challenging to access a fusion relevant parameter range right now even at the most uh, state of at the state of the art facility that we have in europe and in the world it's not possible to reach uh, an arcman number larger than 10 to the power of three this means essentially one order of magnitude less than what we expect uh, in a fusion reactor and uh, another challenge is of course also related to the fact that much of the uh, MHD flow is affected by the volumetric heating that we have in the reactor due to the neutronic bombardment. This is very challenging to recreate in the laboratory, essentially because the favorite, uh, the favorite way to heat up uh, an electrically conducting fluid is to inject current and use the gel effect to simulate that. But you can do that in an MHD problem because it will basically change all the features that you are interested in. Okay, beside that, of course, there is the theoretical approach. Uh, there, the difficulty lies in the fact that your general conservation equation, the conservation of mass, the Navier-Stokes equation, and the energy equation are coupled with the Maxwell equation. This makes it very tough to solve uh, these uh, uh, equation in an analytical way. And of course, it's possible for simple and not very fusion-relevant problems, besides the requiring uh, impressive mathematical skills to accomplish that. So, being these two rules uh, um, very difficult, for this reason, the numerical approach uh, is, uh, is favored. And I want to spend some more words on that so that you can understand what are the uh, issues that are related to this, uh, uh, to this kind of approach. Okay, so uh, a liquid metal uh, uh, computational MHD code should be able to represent uh, all the phenomena that happen in a fusion, uh, uh, in a fusion reactor. What that means? Essentially means to reach a fusion relevant parameter range. And here you can see what I mean. And also you, the code should be able to uh, represent all the physical, physical phenomena that are affect, uh, affected by MHD effects, which includes a, a complex, uh, uh, let's say, coupling of different uh, physics that involve. Besides that, of course, a fusion reactor is a complex uh, environment with a lot of uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, components that are difficult uh, to treat numerically. And of course, you have also many, many materials. So uh, worldwide right now, there is a huge effort in improving the uh, computational MHD tools for this kind of problems. And uh, you can see here on the, on the right, a picture that is showing the progress over the years. Essentially, you can see that we measure the progress in the computational MHD field by uh, tracking the maximum simulated Atmar number that we can access. So why I'm showing you this picture and why I'm talking, basically because I want to make very evident that these tools are still under active development. And this is due to the intrinsic difficulties that we have in the simulation of this flow. One of the reasons why it's difficult to simulate a liquid metal MHD flow is due to the spatial complexity that is related to that. So here you see a picture, essentially I'm showing you how the current paths that are induced in the liquid metal close in order to satisfy the charge conservation law. So as you can see, basically the currents close through boundary layer that are attached to the duct walls. And you can see that the thickness of the boundary layer is itself a power law of the Hartmann number. What that means? It means essentially that as we increase the magnetic field intensity, this boundary layer will get thinner and thinner. And uh, you say, okay, this is not a, a huge deal, uh, uh, even if the boundary layer thickness uh, is, uh, uh, 
is at a scale of a few micrometers. Uh, and you would think that you could solve this problem with wall function, especially if you are familiar with the intricacy of turbulent modeling. Okay. The problem is that uh, uh, MHD boundary layers, uh, it's uh, an active boundary layer, which means that it's not just passively matching the boundary condition at the wall to the solution far from the wall. Like, for example, you could expect for a glacius kind of flow, but rather it's uh, uh, directly affecting what, uh, what happens in the boundary layer is directly affecting what happens far from the wall. For this reason, it's uh, difficult to derive wall function. We need a very fine wall treatment. Typically between six and eight nodes are required close to the wall inside the MHD uh, boundary layer. Plus you have to combine this difficulty with the presence of internal shear layers that can occur in certain conditions, especially for two-dimensional MHD flow. And beside that also the numerical stiffness of the problem, which makes uh, um, which uh, ma makes necessary to use finer and finer time step uh, as you increase your Hartmann number. The solution to these difficulties, these spatial and temporal difficulties, is essentially to use a fine and uniform mesh and HPC, so high performance computing. Of course, the problem related to this numerical modeling is not just a problem of scales and not enough to throw a lot of resources to this problem, also because we have, uh, let's say, more subtle problems when we are dealing with a, a, a liquid metal MHD flow. So most of the numerical tools use an inductionless or low magnetic Reynolds number approximation, which basically decouples uh, the uh, momentum equation from the magnetic field. Basically what we are saying is that we are ignoring the self-induced magnetic field in the liquid that is not affecting the applied one. So. Of course, uh, what we need to determine is the intensity of the Lorentz force. In order to do that, we, we need to use a reference electromagnetic variable, which is the, in most cases, the electric uh, potential. To solve the electric potential field, field, we need to solve this elliptic equation. And then this electric potential distribution is used in the home law in order to determine the current distribution that is then used to calculate Lorentz force. So in order to, since uh, this uh, computation involves the difference between these two quantities that are relatively close to each other, it means that we need to ensure that we have small errors in the computation of electric potential and the velocity field in order to avoid large errors on the current density and satisfy the charge conservation condition. This is a very challenging task that was not solved before 2005, but you can see in this graph you have this huge spike in the accessible Hartmann number, and this was due essentially to a new innovative density, current density scheme, discretization scheme developed at UCLA. So you see that there are, we have uh, a problem of scale, a problem of temporal and spatial scale that we need to resolve in our model, but we have also a problem of discretization scheme that need to be efficient. Another problem that is related to the development of these numerical tools is the problem of verification and validation. I've already mentioned how tough it is to acquire experimental data in order to validate this tool, and this is problem is compounded when you consider that you need to uh, represent so many multiphysics effect. So uh, a way to do verification and validation for this kind of tool is also code to code comparison. And I wanted to mention this study that was done in 2019. Uh, this was considering a downward flow in a square channel, uh, essentially under a non-uniform magnetic field. And this channel uh, was heated uh, um, on a side by a uniform heat flux. So essentially what you have is a MHD flow with natural convection. Uh, this was a very, is a very challenging problem. And uh, let's say this was a um, first of a kind code to code benchmark that involved four institution across the US and the European Union and five numerical codes. And we participated with ANSYS uh, CFX. Uh, so the, um, the code to code benchmark was a re let's say a success since all the codes were able to qualitatively represent all the relevant physics. But as you can see in this picture, there was some quantitatively discrepancy uh, in their prediction. Uh, namely the codes uh, uh, predicted all different uh, separation point for the resiguration bubble that appears close to the heated wall. And you can see what I mean by discrepancy looking at this picture on the right that is showing the velocity profile sampled at this point. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the benchmark was uh, considered a success, but of course you will need the experimental data in order to uh, really progress the development of these tools. 
but would we have a more a bit more comfortable with what we mean by liquid metal MHD? I wanted to also talk about some of the analysis that are performed to uh, support the development of uh, the breeding blanket components. What is important to understand is that depending on where you are in the breeding blanket, your MHD analysis may be required to do, do different things. For example, in the breeding zone, which is the region where the nutrition breeding happens, so that is a region with a relatively large volume and a low mass flow rate, what uh, uh, you are interested in is essentially the determination of the heat transfer coefficient and the velocity profile, essentially because the velocity profile is required for the estimate of tritium permeation toward the coolant or to, for the estimate of, uh, of corrosion. Things change if you are considering uh, different regions in the blanket, for example, the spinal manifold or the, um, the other distribution components. There you have mostly a forced convection regime and you have a high mass flow rate. So what you are interested in is mostly the estimate of MHD pressure loss. Uh, so these, there are several MHD analyses that are performed in this different region, but uh, what they all share in common is that they are performed with direct numerical simulation tools like the one that they have just described. MHD effects, though, are not restricted uh, just to the breathing blanket as a component, but rather they affect the wall reactor as a wall, for example, because the MHD pressure drop is going to affect the design of the breeder loop. And uh, of course, this is a system level analysis that goes beyond the single component. And uh, for that reason, this is the, the scale is much bigger. It's not possible to use direct numerical simulation tool. And uh, these, uh, uh, let's say, study are usually performed with analytical relation or reduced order models. I wanted to mention a couple of uh, MHD um, analysis that were performed to support the design of the water cooled lead lithium blanket, which is one of the leading candidates in the European Fusion Program and is actually one of the two uh, blankets that is going to be tested in ITER starting from, 2000, uh, from 2035. So um, the first analysis that I want to share was uh, related to the uh, spinal manifold that is tasked with the um, with the, um, how to say, conveying the liquid metal from the larger breeder loop to the breeding zone and then retrieval, and then uh, let's say, giving the liquid metal to the tritium extraction system and the reactor fuel cycle. Of course, all these analyses are related to DEMO, so the reactor after reader. So the geometry that was considered in this case was quite peculiar because essentially the spinal manifold was constituted by a channel with two coaxial ducts. The external one that was tasked with distribution and the internal one that was tasked with retrieval. Uh, why this is interesting? First, because it's a relatively complex geometrical configuration that is not very well studied in the literature, and also because uh, it showcased uh, a very peculiar feature of uh, liquid metal MHD problems, which is the problem of electromagnetic coupling. So you remember that essentially we will have the induction of currents in channels. Well, if these channels are let's say, share an electrically conductive wall. So what happens is that a current that is induced in the internal channel, for example, can penetrate the wall and close through the external channel. Why this is important? Well, this is important essentially because uh, the flow features and uh, the parameters of a single, uh, of the flow in a single duct will no longer be dependent only on what happens in that duct, but rather will be influenced by all the other channels that share an electrical contact with it. This means that channels in a breathing blanket can exhibit a, a group behavior, let's say. So it was very interesting to characterize this phenomena in this configuration. Anyway, you can see here some details of the numerical model. I will not bore you with that, but I wanted to just show you the basic phenomena. So we were considering, for example, at the start, uh, the channel at the bottom of the spinal manifold. So the spinal manifold is running all along the blanket segment. So at the bottom, what you expect is that the flow rate is uh, concentrated in the external channel. And uh, conversely, in the internal channel, the retrieval one, as you remember, we will expect the fluid to be stagnant, essentially because uh, no liquid metal has yet been retrieved to be sent to the uh, fuel cycle. What we discover instead is that due to the electromagnetic coupling, electric currents that were generated inside the electrical one entering the internal one will cause the buildup of pressure at the center of the internal channel, which flow, which fluid will then move upward, effectively dragged 
by the fluid in the external channel. To compensate for this unexpected movement, uh, we will also observe the appearance of a reverse flow close to the walls aligned to the magnetic field in the internal channel. Why this is important? It's important essentially because anywhere, anytime that you have a recirculation inside the manifold, what you have is essentially that the liquid metal can stay trapped in the blanket and tritium that is contained in the liquid can have a chance to accumulate. This is harmful essentially for two reasons. First, because it will cause the, um, the increase of the tritium inventory in a reactor, which is a quantity that you have to monitor closely for safety analysis, and also because it can, uh, uh, let's say, lead to radiological uh, consequence. So this was a very nice, let's say, thing to discover, not so much for the design, but nice from the phenomenological point of view. If we move to the top of the manifold, the situation is specular. So the flow rate is all in the internal channel and the external one we expect to be stagnant. Again, the induction of electrical current is causing the appearance of reverse flow in the, in the external channel. Moving to the equatorial plane, in this case, instead the flow rate is equally split uh, between the two channels, but we still observe the presence of reverse flow, this time again in the external channel, like in the top case. So basically what we were able to highlight is that in this geometrical configuration, you can expect to have reverse flow everywhere in the spinal manifold. And this is of course an important uh, uh, concern to bring up to the design team because it could lead to radiological consequences in the case of an accident, as I mentioned. Another important, uh, um, beside this, uh, uh, beside this uh, outcome, another important result that we were able to obtain was to establish a correlation between the pressure loss in a coaxial channel and the theoretical one that is possible to, uh, let's say, calculate for an analog square channel. This is a, was important essentially because if you know this relationship, you don't need expensive and time-consuming three-dimensional MHD calculation in order to estimate the pressure loss. And also because we highlighted that the pressure loss in this configuration is much higher than the reference configuration. And this is not a trivial uh, result to obtain because the pressure loss in the spinal manifold accounts for nearly 15% of the total pressure loss on the wall of the breeder loop, which I want to highlight is around the 15 to 25 bar, depending on where you are in the blanket. Uh, lastly, I want also to share a nice uh, three-dimensional calculation that we perform on the terminal collector, essentially the component that is at the bottom of the seg segment that is tasked with the flow distribution. What we wanted to do uh, was, uh, uh, this was a calculation that was done in support uh, to the dual coolant lead lithium blanket, which is developed uh, in Spain, always for the European fusion program. And uh, in that case, the um, liquid metal has also a task uh, of uh, coolant. So what is important to, uh, um, to determine is that the flow distribution is as uniform as possible, essentially because flow distribution will affect the heat transfer coefficient. What we were interested in to determine was the sensitivity of the inlet position in this component to the uh, flow distribution in the subchannels that will then feed the breeding zone upwards. Uh, so here, of course, there is a snapshot of how the velocity profile looks in the terminal corrector. You can see that you have the flat velocity profile that I highlighted earlier. This is essentially because the dual coolant lead lithium blanket is as insulating the walls. So uh, here is a picture about the flow rate in the three channels. So you see here the orange stars, this there is the hydrodynamic flow distribution. So we not apply the magnetic field. Uh, what we highlighted was that the flow distribution looks completely different when you consider MHD effects. And that in fact, you can expect a severe, severe flow imbalance in the channel that are farther away from the inlet. This is, of course, uh, is an issue for the blanket. So it was, uh, let's say, also a nice contribution that we did uh, to the development of this blanket concept. Essentially, we bring back news. <laughs> but uh, uh, nevertheless, it's better to know that than uh, to, to be left ignorant. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is that, okay, I will show you essentially computational fluid dynamic simulation. But during the years, we also, need does also, um, uh, let's say, be discovered that, uh, I mean, this CFD analysis tend to be very time consuming. They need to tend to be very expensive. Uh, numerical calculation like the one that I just showed you could take, uh, take more weeks on a, a HPC cluster with 100 
of CPUs. So this is of course inconvenient from a design point of view because uh, you need uh, sometimes you need to iterate fast on uh, the design, and so we uh, decided to develop. Uh, a system, thermal hydraulic codes with MHD capabilities, and this was essentially to support uh, the LED lithium loop design, but also we recognize uh, as nuclear engineers, we obsessed with safety and uh, one, uh, and this is something that we need to remind for fission reactor because they are essentially nuclear installation. So an important tool to have, uh, uh, it's uh, a code that is, can be used for safety analysis and for the licensing of this installation. And right now, the, uh, let's say, tools that are most commonly used for this purpose of system thermal hydraulic code. But when we started this activity, there was effectively no one that was, uh, let's say, having the possibility to represent the MHD effects. So we choose one of the leading uh, system thermal hydraulic code, the RELAC 5 mod 3.3 as baseline, and we basically implemented the, the MHD friction factor for several um, for several configuration in order to calculate both distributed and concentrated losses. And here there is, a, a, um, let's say, a, some result regarding to the validation. Essentially, we took as reference uh, the experimental campaign doing on the make on mock-up of a blanket at KIT. This is the test section, and this is the novelization in RELAP. We we're very glad to see that our code was able to recreate very well the local and total pressure trend with accuracy. After that, what we did was, okay, we have this tool, this tool works, let's apply it uh, to the design of the WCLL test blanket module that is going to be uh, used in either in order to qualify the breathing blanket, the concept for a later implementation in DEMO. Uh, here in this case, what is important to see is that we have this manifold that are distributing uh, the fluid and they have quite a complex geometry, but also in this case, we were able to represent mostly the, um, the local pressure trend. And what was important is that we were able to calculate with a very good accuracy, the total pressure loss. You can see here, there is a, a little bit of a difference between the pressure trend. You see here that the pressure profile is going upward. This is because essentially of electromagnetic coupling effects that are training are dragging the fluid. And this is something that our code cannot yet see, but uh, we were lucky enough that uh, basically these effects compensate so that the total pressure loss is the same as in, uh, in our model that is lacking for now the possibility to simulate those effects. Uh, we use the tool basically to assess uh, how you could change the geometry of the WCLL TBM in order to have a more uniform uh, flow distribution of what we were able to, and we were able, uh, let's say, to uh, find a geometrical configuration that has a more uniform flow distribution that has also a relatively reduced pressure loss. And this was done uh, with a fraction of the time that would be necessary for the analog uh, computational MHD simulation. Okay, I think I have uh, run a bit, little bit long. I wanted just to conclude by pointing out uh, how computational MHD analysis have a paramount importance for the development of the liquid metal breathing blankets, essentially because everything changes when you consider the effect of the magnetic field. Right now, computational tools that simulate this kind of flows are still under active development. And right now, state of the art simulation are able to simulate full size blanket system at fission relevant uh, magnetic field intensity. Yeah, there are some recent papers if you want to have a look. What is important to stress is this analysis is still take a lot of time to perform. And also I wanted to uh, also to give a shout out to the guys that work on experiments for the validation of this code. It's very difficult to uh, gather. Uh, exp um, experimental data good enough for that. And there are a lot of uh, limitation and unfortunately it would be difficult to overcome them until we have uh, the TBM program in either to start. And finally, I want to also to give uh, you uh, some idea of some open issues and perspective. Uh, so um, what I do, I talk about the development of numerical tools. I want to stress that data driven modeling techniques like machine learning and neural network are still kind of underexplored on this field. And also I wanted to point out to a field that I expect to have a lot of advancement in the next years, which is multi-phase MHD modeling. This is important for a plasma facing component. Here there is an example of an advanced divertor concept with a flowing lithium uh, film. 
Um, so these, of course, are free surface conditions that are dif different from the single phase flow that I uh, discussed mostly during this talk. And this is important for these components, uh, but it's also important for breeding blankets since you will have helium and tritium transport uh, and also accidental transient that need to be considered with a multi-phase MHD modeling. Like, for example, the inbox loss of coolant accident in a water cooler, the blanket. In there, you will have essentially the flashing of the water that is entering the uh, the, in the much lower pressure liquid metal and then you will have chemical reaction, the generation of hydrogen and the characterization of this phenomenon is very, very important for the licensing of a fusion reactor is something that is very much under active development. Okay, so that's all for my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have questions if you arrived this far following me. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Uh, now uh, is the turn for uh, questions and answers. So uh, please, if you have uh, some question, please raise the, the hand and I will let you let you talk the permission for, for asking. Anyway, if you uh, cannot, you also can write the questions in the in the chat box and we will try to, to answer. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you very, very much for this fantastic presentation. Um, and I, I, I do, as you might expect, have, have a few questions. And um, my very first question is in regards to the uh, CMHD or MHD CFD, uh, which uh, you performed in collaboration with uh, the other universities. You had uh, the relevant slide up earlier and in particular i was uh, wondering if you could please uh, provide some additional information in regards to the tools that were used in specific uh, with regards to the ANSYS fluent and cfx tools and whether um, user-defined functions were employed or did you explore the inbuilt capabilities of those tools Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for this question. So something that I forgot to mention is that nowadays, uh, most uh, commercial CFD tools provide some kind of uh, uh, MHD modeling uh, capabilities. And this was the reason, for example, that we used ANSYS CF CFX. Of course, uh, ANSYS is convenient because essentially provides out of the box modeling. And uh, but it has some limitation in the sense that it's expensive uh, to run HPC calculation using uh, using uh, CFX. So um, the tools that we are using at Savienza uh, are essentially this one and OpenFOAM. Um, OpenFOAM has limited MHD modeling capabilities. Uh, essentially, it has just a solver in its distribution that is um, nevertheless not very good at simulating uh, MHD flows. Essentially, because it's uh, uh, it's using a numerical model that's more suited uh, to metallurgical application. Um, our in-house version of OpenFOAM uh, is modified in order to be more uh, performing for fusion-relevant uh, calculation. And the same is true for the KIT. So they have their in-house version of OpenFOAM that is, yeah. uh, let's say, has this implementation. Console so and Fluent uh, as well has uh, have out-of-the-box modeling capabilities. For Console, you have to... Um, I don't know if you're familiar with console, but essentially you have different modules and you have yes. to make them work together in order to simulate the okay. multiphysics. And the most interesting one though is uh, IMAG that you see here. So IMAG is uh, um, a CFD code that has been developed uh, um, for the very purpose of simulating liquid metal MHD flows. Okay, yeah. so um, this of course has some advantages because they they focus on that, so they have a lot of capabilities. But unfortunately, right now it's not yet available for let's say general use. So mostly they use it uh, just at UCLA. Yeah. I think that things are going to change because uh, of course the company that developed this tool in collaboration with UCLA um, wants to commercialize it, uh, and they should start to do that in the next years. But uh, right now is more of a research gold than a commercial tool. Now, your second second half of the question was about wolf function, right? 
So I, I was more, uh, yeah, I was, I was asking whether you're using the inbuilt capabilities of CFX and Fluent, or if you're actually employing the uh, some user-defined functions that you okay. manually code up. Uh, for CFX, no, you can do that though. Also for Fluent, it's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding wall function, what I want to stress is that the problem with wall function in MHD is that uh, they very much depend on the wall conductivity. So your, your flow features strongly depend on uh, how thick is your bounding wall and how electrically conductive it is. Mm -hmm. So effectively, if you have a wall made of plexiglass or one made of steel, Yes. the boundary layer is going to behave completely different. So this is, makes it very difficult uh, to um, develop wall function. And of course, this difficulty is compounded uh, by the fact that it's uh, tough to gather the experimental database that is used usually to mm -hmm. validate wall function. Now you know that this yeah. is something that is important for two points. Right now, to the best of my knowledge, there are just some wall function for perfectly insulated the walls. Uh, what that means is, is essentially this parameter, C uh, here, is at zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, but as far as I know, I don't think any, just IMAG, the code mm -hmm. the dimension that is purposefully built for that implements them. The other one uh, don't. Thank you. Am I, am I allowed one more question? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. if uh, Jose allows it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted uh, to ask about the interaction, so the, the current leakage between uh, channels or what's uh, otherwise known as the Madarame effect. Yeah, yeah, Madarame effect. Yeah, which uh, you presented earlier. So if I understand correctly, you were, uh, you were able to simulate that using uh, CMHD. But in, in terms of your 1D or um, state equation, so your, your one-dimensional solver, that is by pure luck essentially captured, but not strictly formulated. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I said, the, the RELAP, our version of RELAP does not yet support the simulation of electromagnetic coupling. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why we don't yet have that capability is essentially that is uh, very, right now um, there is a lack of the a theoretical framework to um, reliably predict the effect yeah. of coupling. So for example, for pressure loss, we have uh, analytical correlation and yeah. we have uh, experiments that have been done, for example, to characterize the concentrated pressure loss in a bend. For example, yes. in a chain. Okay. Yes. For coupling, uh, um, it's very difficult to do that because uh, it depends on so many parameters, like uh, the thickness of the shared wall. Mm -hmm. And so you could have the same wall conductance ratio, but depending yeah. on the thickness, you could have different phenomena. Mm -hmm. Also, what it could be, um, what also can happen is that depending on the orientation, of your group of channels, you may have different uh, effects. So it's a very complex uh, subject uh, and uh, it's uh, honestly impossible right now to implement that in a system code. I will not though say that it was too, um, due to lack that we had that uh, agreement uh, because essentially what we, I think we observed is that uh, we have a significant local effect due to coupling in that case because uh, you have a, a big flow imbalance between yes. uh, one side of the manifold, the distribution one, and the collection one. So essentially you have that in the first half of the manifold where the flow rate is uh, bigger in the distribution leg, you have the, the collection, the fluid in the collection leg is uh, dragged. And the opposite happens uh, um, in, the, in the top half. So essentially mm -hmm. what we have seen uh, is that uh, these uh, effects compensate yeah. Basically, you don't have a, um, a total increase of the pressure loss due to coupling. This is instead something that can happen if you have uh, the, flow, uh, the flow rate being the same in channels. So for example, if you have two channels and they are stacked in the, um, I don't want to say something because uh, I don't remember depending on the case, but for example, be with me. If you have two channels that are stacked 
stuck in the direction of the magnetic field, you will have mm -hmm. an increase in the pressure loss. Okay, yeah. this is true for a prototypical case. So two channels, infinitely long, that are connected to each other through just one mm -hmm. wall. It seems that in more complex configuration, you can have a kind of a compensation. And this is why we had, uh, let's say, a low discrepancy on the total pressure loss. Uh, okay. Of course, uh, it's something that we plan uh, to, to do in the future to include some uh, way to model the electromagnetic coupling effects. Uh, actually, there is an analytical uh, solution that has been developed at the Imperial College uh, that is treating this very effect. And we are planning to implement something along that line. That, thus far, I was only aware of the Molokov 1993 solution. Okay. Uh, I, I was not aware of, of the one that was uh, carried out by Imperial. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. To remember all, uh, I post just the, the links for follow us in the in the social media. I think we have one comment of Xiao Cheng. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tassone, for your informative talk. I am a newcomer to MHD modeling for liquid metal. I am wondering if there are any attempts made using open foam or console to model liquid uh, metal as plasma phasing component since there are single phase MHD and multiple uh, multi-phase flow modules in these two kits. So Alessandro? Okay, so yeah, this is an interesting question because um, the simulation of liquid metal for plasma phasing components is is a very interesting field, uh, especially because we expect, I mean, we are very interested in this kind of component essentially because the liquid metal uh, uh, self-regenerate. So you don't have all the issues that are related to using tungsten as the plasma facing material, solid tungsten, I mean. So I can't uh, comment about uh, the use of any specific code for this kind of simulation. Uh, because I don't, I don't remember, I don't recall uh, right now having read any paper uh, using a console, but I will be surprised uh, if there is, uh, there is there hasn't been any such attempt. I know that uh, for sure some calculation have been done with open form, uh, but I couldn't point uh, you right now to any to any any paper, for example. But uh, it's uh, for sure some something that uh, people are working on. I know that that we do, and we are using open form mostly as a multi-phase uh, MHD tool. Okay. I also would like to ask you, Alessandro, um, I watched that you also work with ANSYS uh, software, right? And yeah, that's correct. Do you find uh, in the ANSYS some application specifically for MHD or do you have to make your own code or, or simulation with your own parameters? Uh, so, um, since 2012, uh, ANSYS has uh, out-of-the-box modeling capabilities for MHD. So basically what you have to do is to, um, you have a flag for electromagnetic modeling and you have to specify what kind of uh, um, numerical scheme you want to use and provide the boundary condition. But uh, more or less, you don't. the basic functionality doesn't require any, any user modification. And as far as I know, it's the same for Fluent. Uh, since uh, the latest release, before you had uh, an add-on to do that. But yeah, more or less, uh, you can use it uh, straight away. So you don't need to, you need to understand how to use <laughs> the CF2, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's true for any, <laughs> for any numerical model. Today. OK. We have also from Philip. He raised the, the hand. Philip, uh, if you want to, to talk. Yes, thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. <clears throat> I would just <clears throat> want to ask you, uh, when you mentioned the backflows that appeared in the, in the manifold, what are they caused by? So you mean uh, why we had the reverse flow in that configuration? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, as I was trying to uh, explain, uh, is uh, mostly due to these uh, leakage currents uh, that cause the electromagnetic coupling between the two channels. So essentially what you have is that, okay, for, for example, the bottom case, the, 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 one, the first one that I show. Okay, let me go back there. Huh? No, I went too much. Okay, you see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so you see uh, here you have uh, essentially the current topology. 
uh, here at the center of the coupled case. So you see these lines are essentially the current streamlines. Okay. So what happens is that this current uh, enter the internal channel. You see they have this very weird shape. Okay. So as I tried to um, explain at the beginning, so this current uh, will interact with the applied magnetic field. Now, due to the shape of the currents, uh, essentially what you have uh, is that at the center of the channel, you have a, a net Lorentz force that is pushing uh, the liquid uh, upward at the center. This is because of uh, how the currents are induced. Okay, if you want, it's just the cross product that is making the liquid behave in that way. And uh, of course, uh, since currents tend to close uh, on themselves uh, due to the charge conservation uh, condition, what you have is that close to, the, to this region here, uh, to the internal walls that are aligned to the magnetic field, these currents reverse their direction. And so in this case, you have a downward Lorentz uh, force that will cause uh, the, let's say, fluid uh, to go to move downward. So you have the generation of these regions where the fluid is moving uh, differently. And uh, a nice touch you can see here uh, is also that uh, there is some downward flow really also in the uh, external channel. And that's mostly due to the annular configuration rather than the coupling, but nevertheless, it's uh, nice to highlight. I don't know if this make it clearer in a way. Yes, perfect. Thank you for explaining. Okay, it is essential due to the cross products. If you yes. <laughs> if you think you're right end, you will you will see what I mean uh, quite easily. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, we have uh, another one from Gary. So I, I promise it's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> If Alexander has no problem, me neither. <laughs> oh no, I'm very, I'm very happy to stay in chat with everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's about your very last slide where you showed the liquid film, uh, metal films, and I was uh, simply wondering um, if there are any concerns about uh, contamination during disruption events. So many, so many concerns. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's a very, it's very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult topic, and I'm not. Uh, I mean, I'm not uh, really. My field is more for bounded flows, so it's just something that we are starting to work on. But yes, there, there are a lot of concerns about that, essentially for the stability of mm -hmm. the film, yeah. uh, because uh, you may have a plasma liquid metal interaction. So you have the electric fields and magnetic fields from the plasma that are interacting with the, with the, with the liquid metal. So you will have uh, an unstable film, so splashing droplets that go into the plasma. And then of course the discharge <laughs> suddenly terminates. So yeah, stability yeah. is a big problem for that kind of diverters. Also another um, another problem is that since the liquid metal is effectively the armor of your yes. uh, of your plasma facing component, you must be sure at all times that you have uh, a sufficient thickness. Because imagine what happens if the, um, the substrate is exposed. That's not a, um, the substrate of that kind of diverter is uh, functionally a heat sink. So it's yeah. no longer a high heat flux component, so it will basically be destroyed. Yes. Okay. So I show that picture because this basically that was uh, what I had on end. But there are many liquid metals uh, plasma facing component uh, concepts. That's just one. I want to mention one that is um, considered. This is studied uh, at uh, Enea Frascati, uh, that is close to Rome. In that case, they have uh, instead a capillary pore system. So they yes. are basically a sponge of tungsten that is filled with the liquid metal. In that case, what they are interested, in that case, MHD, why it's important essentially to make sure that the, how the liquid metal evaporates, uh, it's not going to change when the magnetic field is applied. And if the liquid metal is going to wet the sponge as they expect to, so that kind of, there are also that problem. Essentially any, any um, liquid metal uh, PFC concept as is onset or MHD issues. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you. Okay. If you have any questions else, uh, thank you again, Alessandro, and thank you all for participating in the talk. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for attending.